Alex Del Carmen is with the School of Criminology at Tarleton State University. He's also the director of the Institute for Predictive and Analytics in Criminal Justice. Um, doctor, thanks for being with us. The question at hand, do mandatory minimum sentences work? Do they actually reduce crime? Well, thanks for having me again. Uh, look, it depends on who you ask, right? I mean, there are some people that are convinced that if you sentence someone for a mandatory minimum, you are going to remove that person from society and therefore that person cannot commit crimes. In the field of criminology, we actually call that incapacitation. The idea that they're not gonna be out there in the streets engaging in other crimes. The other side of the coin is that there are individuals that argue that these mandatory minimums take away from the judges any kind of discretion that they may have, which in fact may result in a better sentence or a sentence that perhaps may be more equitable to the actual crime that was committed. So the jury is still out, no pun intended, as to whether or not, you know, these are actually adequate or not. Dr. Del Carmen, all of this is based on what I call the TV system of criminal justice, where everything is wrapped up in a nice tight bow. But in reality, there are prosecutors with too many cases and defendants with too little money. I'm thinking about, for instance, the Central Park Five. Uh, where one of them is now running for city council in New York because they were wrongfully convicted. Right, and it, and it happens more often than not. And we also know that in the past, when we didn't have the DNA technology that we have now, uh, you know, there were not one, but multiple individuals that were incarcerated sometimes for the rest of their lives. Had it not been because of the most recent technological advances, we would have never known that these individuals were in fact innocent. And I think to your point in your question, right, these mandatory minimums, what they do is they, you know, if in fact the evidence is not conclusive and the criminal justice system happens to uh, ignore the evidence, that individual can face a great deal of time for something that may not necessarily uh, be commensurate to the punishment that is uh, actually given by a judge. Is the system broken from the top all the way down? You know, um, I smile when I hear that because of the fact that we in criminology talk about that oftentimes, right? We know that that the system is far from being perfect. I often tell my students that it is the best system or one of the best in the world, unquestionably, but it does make and, and allow for errors, and some of which are related to racial backgrounds of individuals and others are related to socioeconomic status. I mean, we know that the system of justice um, looks a certain way to people that are wealthy and looks another way to people that don't have the money to pay for high-end attorneys that would actually be able to look for a more lenient sentence. Let's talk about recidivism. A study from the Bureau of Justice Statistics finding more than two-thirds of people released from prison re-arrested again within three years. One argument for supporters of mandatory minimums is that they keep people behind bars longer. What do you say about that? You know, part of it is the institutionalization, right, of the individual. And by virtue of that, there are people that go to prison for crimes that they have committed, but they're not necessarily career criminals. And while they are in prison, they're going to be learning how to do things more effectively, if you want to call it that, or to be more effective criminals. And so by the time they're released, they're going to come out with a the equivalent of a four, five, seven-year indoctrination and, uh, and learning experience on how to be a more violent criminal or a more serious criminal and go back to the same environment that they left before they were sentenced to prison, which is a recipe for disaster. I once did an investigation on a judge who actually sentenced people to work on his farm. And we know of prisons and states that use inmates for really what constitutes enslaved labor. Um, supporters, though, say the mandatory minimums eliminate the personal bias of prosecutors and judges. But does that work in every case? You know, I would argue that, that the mandatory minimums were established with the sense that somehow taking that discretion away from the judge makes the system, you know, less partial to injustice, right? But at the same time, one could argue that just the filing of the charges, the, the legal representation that those individual defendants are going to have, whether or not is done by private attorneys versus a court appointed attorneys, whether or not the person has the money to hire the dream team equivalents that OJ Simpson once did versus, you know, someone that can hardly afford 
to pay for a mediocre attorney to represent them. I think all of those factors will make a huge difference in the outcome of the case before those mandatory minimums are actually imposed on the individual. I want you to listen to what one expert had to say just a moment ago in Chris Conti's report on the issue of a level playing field. Take a listen. Sometimes the sentence a person gets depends more on which judge he draws than what he did. And that is not just, and uh, it sometimes results in excessively lenient sentences. So how can we have a system that is fair when that is actually the case? And do you agree? Well, you know, the, the, the judge that actually receives the case makes a difference. But I would argue that let's begin, you know, from the entry uh, component of the criminal justice system, right? The person gets arrested and is booked in a jail and the person is make or may not make bond. Um, or bail, and it's all based on socioeconomic factors and whether or not the person is a quote-unquote recidivist or not. And, and many factors actually affect that individual from that perspective or from that point of entry all the way until the person gets sentenced. And so, you know, everything makes a difference. But what, what we know in the criminal justice system and those of us that have studied it in my case for 25 years is that money matters a great deal. All the studies seem to suggest that if you have money, you're able to have a more lenient sentence. You're able to equate the playing field in a different way by virtue of better legal representation. So by the time you start looking at the injustices imposed by a judge or the absence of a bad judge, I would argue that the, that the system is already way underway uh, in terms of its injustice. Dr. Alex Del Carmen. Uh, doctor, thank you very much. And a reminder, stay with us for our next hour. Our The Truth About Crime series continues. We'll take a critical look at school shootings and about the way the schools are now designed. We'll also take a look at a curved hallway that they say could save lives. That's next on your evening debrief. And then tune in Thursday night for our Scripps News special. I'll be hosting a live discussion with more topics like this. Eye-opening insights from a panel of